In the past, we have, as you saw yesterday's excellent talk by Paul Bernhardt, the Cedar Prize Lecture. And that's been a, a long-term lecture series that uh, has recognized outstanding scientific contribution. And, and it's in the past five years to Cedar. It's a, it's, it's a near-term contribution to Cedar science. And every time that we uh, go through that evaluation of um, the prize lecture contributions, invariably, a number of nominations come in saying, this person has done such tremendous work over so long and has contributed to CEDAR for, for, the, for an extended amount of time um, that uh, they should be recognized. And there's always this push and pull within the CEDAR steering committee saying, well, how do we do the prize lecture is five years, but this person definitely has, you know, and they published the paper last year, so that's good. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it is a, a different animal. So we decided that uh, to create a new lecture series, what we call the Distinguished Lecture Series, and the, um, the idea there is that it's a sustained body of work over 10 years plus that has contributed to Cedar Science. And, um, and it's my pleasure today to have Dr. Ray Robel be the first recipient of that, uh, of this uh, distinguished lecture series. And so prior to uh, Dr. Robel's talk, Dr. Hanley Liu will uh, give a little bit of background on Ray and, and introduce him to the, uh, to the audience. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I think our first speaker this morning doesn't really need any introduction. Um, his uh, monumental research uh, over the last few decades has shaped the CEDAR research. And, uh, and he has developed the models uh, that have become indispensable for the upper atmosphere study. And he, he's also an inspirational mentor who has uh, nurtured generations of scientists in space and atmosphere sciences. And uh, his, uh, his distinguished achievements have been recognized by the National Academy of Sciences in 1996 by awarding him the uh, Aktowski Medal. So it is uh, my great honor uh, this morning to introduce you to our first CEDAR uh, Distinguished Lecturer, Dr. Ray Robo. That's on. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This is an incredible honor for me to be able to give the first distinguished CEDAR lecture. Um, <clears throat> and thanks for postponing it a year from last year. We had a family emergency and uh, <clears throat> couldn't make it last year, uh, which was okay because that was scheduled for 8 to 9 in the evening. And it was supposed to be kind of an entertaining talk, but I'm no Jay Leno. And I can't. <laughs> so when I saw it at 8 a.m. this time, I said, oh boy, that's, that's more my, my style. <laughs> Since this is the first um, CEDAR lecture, uh, there hasn't been any real guidance as to how one should uh, prepare or what one should do. So I have a large license to just kind of formulate the, the talk that I want to give. And <clears throat> so I normally, Oh, and already we can see from last year, uh, this division no longer exists, this ISIL, so we can cross that one out, and we now have a totally different division. You can't be organized too long in, in administrative uh, things. So the, uh, now for the past 35 years, I've normally started with this particular slide. And <laughs> with the <coughs> idea with the fact to show just where in the atmosphere um, I, the modeling has gone and where it will is, is, uh, is directing. So <clears throat> what I show here is uh, altitude versus the temperature, the troposphere, stratosphere, and the mesosphere. And with the time GCM, I'll be talking about the atmosphere from about 30 to 500 kilometers that encompasses only about a percent of the entire atmosphere. I normally plot it this way because if I plotted it in pressure coordinates, then the thermosphere would look something like this, 
instead of being extended and then look so big in this region. Now the, the talk outline that I've got is how and why the TGCMs were developed at NCAR, their present day capability and how they're being used in CDAR. And then I'll talk about future modeling efforts in a changing climate that is currently going on. And uh, <clears throat> so, So it all started back after I finished my stint in the Navy, where I was the engineer officer on board a destroyer, and then I worked for a couple of years in industry as a mechanical engineer at the Bendix Research Corporation. I met Paul Hayes at a football game, and I said, save me from mechanical engineering. <laughs> and, and he said, I have this uh, uh, <coughs> uh, project called Atmospheric Sounding by Stellar Refraction, so come on to work at NCAR. And then slowly started taking uh, courses, and eventually ended up with the thesis project, which was to build a Fabry Perot and measure the response of the atmosphere to the heating in the stable auroral red arc. Now, the stable auroral red arc is excited up in the ring current by various processes, proton uh, instabilities, and so forth. And the heat flows down along the magnetic field line and then creates rings and magnetic conjugate hemispheres. And the idea was to see if there was a temperature response and whether there were winds generated by this heating and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> I measured a very weak response, very little wind, and I tried modeling it uh, using to determine the circulation pattern shown here as a mass flow stream function, but I was never able to solve that. I found two limiting cases, a thermal conduction uh, solution and an adiabatic expansion solution. And at the time, I noticed in a paper in 1967, a paper by Dickinson, Lagos, and Newell, who did a first kind of numerical model of the thermosphere dynamics. And I knew that Bob Dickinson was coming to, to NCAR. So as a postdoc, after finishing up this project, I came to NCAR and began working with Bob. At the particular time, he and Cicely Ridley were doing a two-dimensional zonal average model of the Venusian thermosphere. And they were doing it analytically. They were solving a sixth order hypergeometric ordinary differential equation with all sorts of boundary conditions. And they worked on it for about eight months. Very, very hard, complex mathematics. And then they finite, they programmed it in finite difference and got the same answer in, in two seconds on a CDC 6600 computer. Well, <coughs> that was the end of of analytic uh, things, although I do remember a Chinese person solving a eighth order uh, hypergeometric ordinary differential equation, which included the Coriolis terms. Uh, but that has never been published, and it was an unpublished report, and I lost it, and unfortunate. But there is one, one up at other level. But then we moved into modeling, uh, numerical modeling, and um, and the first thing that I <coughs> developed in trying to develop a, a two and three dimensional model, I first have to start with a global mean. And with the global mean model, you can put in all sorts of physical processes, all the aronomy, all the reactions, many, many, many chemical reactions. And then you can do about a thousand different experiments, several thousands, change the reaction rate, change the branching ratio, change the eddy diffusion coefficient. And slowly you build up a, a kind of a feeling for how the thermosphere uh, should respond to the uh, various processes. And that's very important before you start putting a complex scheme like this into a 2 or 3D model because you never know whether it's a numerical problem, it's an untuned eddy diffusion, or whether there's some other process. So uh, starting out any kind of modeling, I would recommend that you do it first in, in 1D and then take it over and put it into 2 and 3D models. Now the first model that we did was use that model that uh, uh, Cicely Ridley and uh, Bob Dickinson developed for the zonal circulation on the planet Venus and adopt it to the uh, Earth's atmosphere. And here I show the mass flow stream function uh, in the thermosphere from about 97 to 500 kilometers. And during equinox, we have a solar-driven circulation in the lower atmosphere that goes from 
uh, the equator to both poles, but at the high latitude it's reversed. And this high latitude reverse cell is due to the auroral heat inputs uh, and or due to particle precipitation and joule heating separating around in the lower thermosphere around 120, 130 kilometers. So this pattern is, exists during uh, equinox, but within about a week or two after equinox, you develop this solstice type circulation. You go from the summer hemisphere, or developing summer hemisphere toward the winter, and then the joule heating in the winter hemisphere is strong enough to kind of reverse the cell to mid-latitudes here. In the summer hemisphere, it reinforces the solar-driven circulation. And then as you get to October, it intensifies, and then it goes back to solstice. And then it weakens and weakens and goes through the spring equinox. And so this is kind of the, the general pattern that the thermosphere uh, responds to uh, <clears throat> the joule heating affecting the upper thermosphere, but the solar heating keeping control in the lower thermosphere. And the response to geomagnetic storms uh, during very quiet storms, uh, just an aurora here, or five or six developing substorms during a particular day, or a geomagnetic storm uh, as shown here in these uh, satellite photos of the cities of lights of the United States and, and the aurora. <laughs> And so for equinox, you have this kind of a circulation for the average condition, much stronger auroral heating, and then during the storm, a reversal all the way to the, uh, to the equator. And for solstice, you, you get the summer to winter circulation, uh, reinforcement from the auroral heating in the summer hemisphere and a reversal in the winter, and then for the storm. And then it oscillates back and forth and then goes through these seasonal transitions and, and other effects. So this was uh, brought, shown in the uh, 2D modeling that we did in the 1970s. <clears throat> then at about 1978, uh, Cicely Ridley and Bob Dickinson said, well, why don't we take the NCAR general circulation model, a finite difference model, third order generation, and adapt it to thermospheric heights. So we took out the mountains, the clouds, the radiation, all the processes that exist in the lower troposphere and put in fast vertical diffusion and other physical processes to make it applicable to the thermosphere. And the model, the first model, was called the thermosphere general circulation model between about 100 and 500 kilometers. But it, we solved mainly the dynamics. We didn't have, uh, we had to specify a lot of empirical processes like an ionosphere, a dynamo, composition from emsis, aurora processes, solar, and tides. So all this had to be specified and we solved the dynamic equations. And about that time, we had uh, programs that we could use that model to, uh, uh, to work against. The Atmospheric Explorer, Dynamics Explorer, Radar and Airglow, and of course, SEDAR. And if you notice, SEDAR is very prominent in every one of these uh, efforts as the models uh, got uh, developed. So we then included the ionosphere in a self-consistent fashion. Our, Richmond and I came up with a scheme. Uh, we included it and became the TI G GCM. And then Art and Cicely Ridley came in with a dynamo and it became the thermosphere ionosphere electrodynamic general circulation model. And now this model has been developed by Stan Solomon and the whole group at NCAR, Ben Foster, and and that, and it is now available online so that you can download this particular model and make your own runs available. At the time, we worked with Christophe Pamerant and he coupled very quickly to the inner magnetosphere. Uh, so we had an MTIE GCM. And then <clears throat> when the UR satellite came by and made a lot of measurements down in the mesosphere region, extended the model down to 30 kilometers, so 30 to 500, and the, uh, the uh, parameters that had to be input were still the aurora and solar, and these are the programs that it was involved. And then as an experiment in about 1995, uh, Ben Foster and I did a flux coupling uh, to see whether it was feasible to develop a model that goes all the way from the ground to the top. But we didn't extend the time GCM downward. Uh, that was too complicated at the time. We, said, well, let's use a flux coupler and then take the NCAR community climate model 
and flux couple it at the boundary of around 30 kilometers with the time GCM. So information could pass back and forth between the two particular models. And I'll show some results of that. And then eventually that set the stage that yes, indeed, it's possible to develop a model of the whole, the atmosphere. And so along with Rolando Garcia and Byron Beauville and myself, we decided in about the year 2000 to start the development of Wacom. And the Wacom is a whole atmosphere community climate model. And Han Liu has extended it all the way up to 500 kilometers. So these are the, the models and the, their historical development. And uh, it's been a slow process all the way from the 1970s all the way to uh, the present. Now the first TGCM runs are shown here. This is a, a snapshot. And uh, <coughs> this particular um, latitude, longitude slice of the neutral temperature contours and the arrows for the winds uh, show a very pronounced semi-diurnal type of oscillation in the lower thermosphere. And the reason that that occurs is because the, the heating is optically thick and your diurnal and semi-diurnal components are, are out of phase and, or in phase, and so you develop a, a very strong semi-diurnal type of oscillation. But as you move into the upper thermosphere, then the heating distribution becomes uh, optically thin. And so your, your diurnal and semi-diurnal components of the heating are out of phase. And you generate a diurnal type pattern where you have high temperatures during the daytime, low temperatures at night. The ion drag at this at particular altitude is much stronger than the Coriolis force by about an order of magnitude. And so you get a basic flow that goes from the high pressure, high temperature region on the day side to the low pressure, uh, low density at night. And at high latitudes, you have the influence of the auroral circulation as specified by an empirical model. Now, <clears throat> at high latitudes, one has to include a, um, an empirical model for the uh, auroral processes, a auroral particle precipitation. You have to develop an oval and also an ion convection pattern. I think this is from an early model by Rod Helis, uh, who developed it, which showed the convection pattern, the ion drift, the electric potential. There's a dawn to dusk electric potential drop across the polar cap, and that drives a ion circulation that's a two cell pattern uh, in the Earth. And it's like taking a, a giant egg beater and putting it in over, right over the, the, the polar region and circulating the, um, the neutral gas. And through collisions, you get a very strong response to the uh, neutral atmosphere. The upper part is over the polar cap, and these are perturbation temperatures from a global mean. And uh, the, this particular one is for solar heating only, no aurora. Uh, involved, no ion convection and no particle precipitation. When you do a 20 kilovolt cross cap potential, you then develop a certain amount of wind. Uh, the winds are approaching about 100 or 200 meters a second. And then finally at a 60 kilovolt, you get a very strong response, stronger, uh, almost symmetrical for this particular uh, calculation uh, in the polar cap. Very strong from the day to the night and a return current at, at this time. Now, in the, um, once that particular model was developed, the TIGCM, we had an opportunity to compare against data. All these models were always compared against data, whether it was airglow, fabry perot winds, radar measurements of ion density, and satellites. And here we show a cross-section of winds measured by the Dynamics Explorer, measuring a anti-sunward flow in the polar cap and a sunward flow that part of that two cell pattern. And then these little arrows along the side are individual Fabry Perot uh, developed winds. And so then these came from the CDAR program. And we show it at two various local times or universal times seven universal time, nine, and 11. And we can see the various satellite uh, crosses at about two hour intervals uh, showing this two cell pattern and the model simulation. Uh, on, on the right-hand side. Well, the next step in the model development, we had the thermosphere, we had it coupled to composition, and we have it coupled to the ions. 
So now the next thing was to develop the electrodynamics. And Art Richmond and Cicely Ridley worked very hard in designing a dynamo model, and we included it into the time GCM in an interactive way. So at every time step, you solve the dynamo, the ionosphere, and the neutral temperature. And we had the quite uh, uh, couplings, like through photochemistry, through a neutral parallel uh, component to the ion drift, uh, uh, changing the ionosphere and the O plus diffusion, the thermospheric structure. There is a J cross B force from the dynamo, and the winds were generating the dynamo. Their electrical conductivity and E cross B drifts. What you still had to specify were the external forcings through the upper and lower boundary. And the upper boundary was solar EUV, UV, and, and auroral inputs. Uh, the magnetospheric electric field had to be superimposed at high latitudes. The ionospheric dynamo was primarily solving up to the, um, <clears throat> up to the auroral zone, but then we blended it in with a, with a ion convection model, an empirical ion convection model. And then finally, through the global scale wave model, uh, putting in tides of various amplitudes, diurnal, semi-diurnal, wave number 2223, two, two, and, and various components all the way up to 26. And the first solution that we had is shown here. Uh, they have the TIE GCM at 350 kilometers, uh, high temperature, high pressure in the day side, low temperature, low pressure at night. And these are the neutral winds that go with it. Uh, strong, weak neutral winds in the day side, much stronger at night. And this is the calculated uh, dynamo electric potential and ion drift. You can see that the uh, strong E region conductivity during the day side uh, shorts out the E region. And so you get very small ion drifts. But then when the E region goes away at night, you're left with the F region dynamo and the winds or the ion drifts uh, tend to pick up. And there's about an 8,000 volt potential difference between uh, early morning hours and, uh, and uh, evening hours. One interesting thing is that in the equator where the dynamo lifts the, uh, the field line in the equatorial region up to high altitudes, ion drag is reduced. So you create kind of a tunnel. And, and in that tunnel, you get winds that will be accelerated because there's a lack of ion uh, of resistance, ion drag in that particular region because the field line has been lifted by the electric fields to high latitudes. So there are these uh, neutral uh, ionosphere electrodynamic effects that began appearing in this particular model. Now this slide I'll just show you, I've tried to do everything self-consistent in this model so that it's only having um, a forcing by uh, external processes. We have the solar EUV and UV process and the aurora. He solves for the electron ion temperature equation, all these ion species, major species diffusion, minor species diffusion for the odd nitrogen system on the thermosphere, and that leads to heating and dual heating. So all this is in the TIE GCM. But then with the time GCM, I just dropped it down to about 30 kilometers, and I had to pick in an uh, D region ion chemistry, uh, minor species of all the hydrogen and oxygen and, and NO uh, processes, and minor species for water vapor, hydrogen, H2, methane, and all these. And basically, there's not very much new, but ba it, it basically has all the chemistry that it's above, say, 30 kilometers that is in the book by Brasseur and Solomon. So it is very comprehensive. Uh, model and it's uh, coupled in. So, uh, but the two models in the thermosphere, the TIE GCM and the time GCM, are very similar. Now, the first kind of time GCM results, we, we immediately uh, compared it with the UR's measurements. And here I show the zonal wind at 12 local time from uh, UR's. And it's windy, Gordon Shepard's windy instrument and Paul Hayes's hardy instrument combined by McClandris, and you see a very strong um, <clears throat> semi-annual forcing at around 80 kilometers, a region, very interesting, upward positive response up above there, and the zonal, the Meridiano winds show very strong tidal components, uh, shifting with a 
a vertical wavelength around 25 kilometers, penetrating all the way up to about the base of the uh, lower thermosphere where it's then dissipated by molecular diffusion, ion drag, and, and other processes that are operating in the lower thermosphere. And in the upper thermosphere, you have the basic diurnal circ circulation. And the time GCM simul uh, simulations were really quite uh, good uh, comparing to it. Uh, you can see the Meridiano winds were uh, pretty much in phase and the same magnitude uh, with a semi-annual momentum source. You would be able to reproduce this. And then this upward uh, region here, which might be due to gravity waves or Kelvin wave disappearance or even more the uh, eastward propagating uh, Wave number three, non-migrating tide, that also appears to have a complement up there, too. Now, with that time GCM uh, tune for equinox and uh, solstice simulations, uh, you can turn it loose and run it for a full year and see what happens. And in this particular simulation, it's for uh, Joe Shea, around 42 degrees for Fort Collins, so I could compare with his LIDAR observations. And uh, for the month of the year, and this is just a generic run. There is no variable forcing in this. The solar forcing is constant. The aurora forcing is constant. The tides are slowly varying as a function of month. Gravity wave forcing has a very slow seasonal variation. So this, this just shows how the, the middle atmosphere of part of the model responds uh, over a cycle. And during the summer, you have a warm, stratosphere temperature and a cold mesopause, and then up in the thermosphere you have, once again in the summer, uh, strong solar heating to give maximum temperatures. But when one includes all the forcing, and by all the forcing I mean solar F10.7 is varying on a daily basis, the aurora through the KP index is varying on a three-hour basis, and at the lower boundary, we still have the tides varying slowly and gravity waves, but then we couple it so that it uses realistic data at the lower boundary. We specify the geopotential height at 30 kilometers and at, uh, the temperature at 30 kilometers from uh, meteorological data, the NCEP meteorological data, and also we can use ECMWF uh, for, for this particular case. And this shows uh, <coughs> Very strong planetary wave activity in the, mesos the mesosphere, quiets down during summer, and then picks up again in the fall. So the winter months are very disturbed. Uh, in the mesosphere, it's very cold, but we have this uh, 6.5 day wave showing up in this particular region that occurs during the transition period. Some influence of auroral processes up there, but it shows the kind of variability that one gets when you include all these processes and try to do a realistic model. And we needed to do this because CEDAR has measurements out of a specific date, a specific time, and so forth. So you want to be able to, and if you're going to compare it with data, you have to force the model in the exact same way that the, the, uh, the data is being obtained. And that's why we coupled it to the NCEP and ECMW forcing at the lower boundary to get the planetary waves right because they filter the tides and they filter the, um, <clears throat> they filter the gravity waves too. Now this is very important. Uh, the, the structure of the tide is very important. Uh, the, and here I'm just concentrating on the diurnal tide. And these are the various air glow layers. We have uh, 5.3 micron radiative cooling up high, 15 micron IR cooling high, uh, the green line air glow, the O2 air glow, the sodium air glow, and the OH air glow. And these are the various altitudes at which they normally appear. Now, if the diurnal tide is very weak, it might go up there and perturb the OH emission and not affect the processes or the other air glow emissions up above there. But if they get medium, then they might penetrate through two of these, but still the green line is not affected. If it's very strong, it can get up and affect all these air glow layers. And if it becomes super tide, it'll go all the way up and affect things in the dynamo region and also these infrared radiative cooling. And I've seen in the simulations uh, the, some very tidal, strong tidal influences on both the CO2 15 micron and the 5.3 micron 
cooling. And here's a very nice example of the time GCM for atomic oxygen. It's uh, shown here, it was based on a study that Gordon Shepard and I looked at, where he had uh, windy observations over the uh, equa equatorial region, uh, zero to two and a half degrees latitude, and you can see the effect of tide, taking what the atomic oxygen would normally be a, a constant layer at around 100 kilometers, and the tide just grabs the atomic oxygen, brings it down to low altitude, recombines it, because you're going into a denser atmosphere, and then another wave forms up here and brings the uh, atomic oxygen down. And this shows up very clearly in the green line, too, because it's related to the atomic oxygen and the temperature profile. And another air glow that's shown here is the OH emission at 8.3, and this is shown at the equator. Uh, <coughs> this is function of latitude. I, I guess it's uh, not shown here. But uh, <coughs> there's a, about an 87 kilometer a peak, but uh, at the equator, this tide at this particular local time, which is pretty close to midnight, brings the atomic oxygen and also some atomic hydrogen down, because atomic hydrogen can also be affected by these uh, emissions, or by these tides. And so we get an enhancement uh, in air glow due to this tidal structure. Now it's very important, the, the, uh, the resolution of the model is very important. The original time GCM was like in the thermosphere, a five degree latitude, five degree longitude, two grid points per scale height. But when you apply it to the mesosphere at that same uh, resolution, uh, you, you find that your tides are, are very weak. This is a meridiano wind, uh, wave number one amplitude, and you see that the, you know, the tides have a longer wavelength and they're uh, uh, much smaller in amplitude. Now, the trick in the past to, in order to bring that up to observations would be take the global scale wave model, amplitude, and, and, and double it. And when you do that, then you start getting a much stronger tide. And this is still the five degree model, but you doubled the amplitude, and now it's beginning to look more like observations, uh, much closer. But when you say, no, you really have to improve the resolution, and you go to 2.5 degree latitude and longitude, and you go to four grid points per scale height, now you don't have to double the amplitude. Uh, you can use the regular amplitude and phase that comes right out of the global scale wave model, and you get a very large tide. And so <clears throat> this shows that when you have these models, you have to test them at various resolution, and some phenomena that you think you're doing very well or multiplying by a factor of two is just a normal consequence of needing higher resolution. And the amplitudes of the wave number one uh, is just shown here to show you how the zonal or the meridional wind amplitude increases uh, this is the five degree uh, global scale wave model without any factor of two, with the factor of two, and this with just the higher resolution. So the higher resolution certainly brings out, uh, <clears throat> and, and it points out the need in the mesosphere uh, that things like tides, planetary waves, even gravity waves will be affected depending upon the resolution. And one needs to explore with their model to get the right uh, resolution for the particular phenomena that they're, they're looking at. Now here's a run in um, 2002, two different uh, sections. Uh, this is the thermospheric portion of 2002, and I think it's, yeah, it's at a latitude of uh, minus 52, so it's in the southern hemisphere, and longitude minus 150. And in the thermosphere, you can see the influence all this variability is primarily the seasonal variability and the auroral inputs that are affecting the uh, propagation of gravity waves and other uh, features to lower latitudes and altitudes. In the mesosphere, in 2002, we had a very strong strat warm. Uh, <clears throat> during the uh, summer month, the, the kind of the first major strat warm ever observed in the year 2002. And here you can see that the model in this September, August, September time frame, which is uh, spring in the southern hemisphere, that you get these very strong planetary wave activity prior to the development of the stratworm. And the stratworm, you, you get 
warm temperatures in the stratosphere penetrating on up, and then they, in the mesosphere you get strap cooling, or mesosphere cooling. So be, <clears throat> you begin to see that the strap warm not only affects the stratospheric structure and its circulation, but that there's a responding uh, thermospheric or mesospheric circulation up at higher altitudes. Now it's important uh, for, the, for the tidal structure. Um, as I showed, the resolution was very important for getting the diurnal and uh, primarily the diurnal uh, structure right. Semi-diurnal has a longer wavelength, but uh, it was very important. But then, but then when you want to do um, uh, non-migrating tides, uh, you also have to have a very high resolution on that. And uh, Maura Hagen and uh, others have used this uh, <clears throat> time DCM simulations and put in some non-migrating tides. An important non-migrating tide is the eastward propagating wave number three. And that shows up in, in a satellite, uh, as shown up in here, the FUV image uh, at ionospheric emissions, and you see a wave number four here. And that's a, the wave number four is just a consequence of the way the satellite samples it over a daily pattern but it's really identified as the eastward propagating wave number three non-migrating component. So there are other components in the tidal structure, not just the migrating, but the non-migrating structure that are important, and one model has to have a, a, the appropriate resolution. Uh, now I'm just going to show a TIE GCM run for a full year, and <clears throat> now we're so just a movie, this is the neutral thermospheric temperature, and it, the flickering is due to auroral forcing and, and its high response, and the seasonal variation going from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere. But over a course of a year, you, you get a kind of a, a very dynamic response up there in the, in the thermosphere. And the same thing with the F region. Uh, <clears throat> For the NMF2, and, and you notice that this is fixed with respect to the sun. It's not moving. Actually, you know, if it was with the rotating Earth, it would rotate around, but uh, Ben Foster has slowed it down and put it in this format where you could see the variability uh, of the daytime uh, case by looking just at the, the sunlit side. So you can see the, the type of variability that exists in the ionosphere. Uh, through this movie. Now with Henry Rishbeth and Michael Mandillo, we had a really good test in that year 2002. Uh, Henry got us nine radio sound data, and, <clears throat> and we had a very detailed uh, set of radio sound data for NMF2, uh, or NMAX, uh, <clears throat> for that. This is the simulation of that NMAX over a year over the station Chilton, which is in England. Uh, and this is made with the TIE GCM. And you can see over the, the full course of a year that the model follows, and there's just a lot of variability, whereas the model is a little more stable. So we were always wondering where this additional source of variability is coming from. Uh, the time GCM, and you could shake the lower boundary a little bit and, and, and get it. So we moved to the time GCM, used NSEP at the lower boundary and some tidal forcing, and I think we got a little bit better, but still the data show much greater variability than the model, and, uh, <clears throat> and this is still a very active um, uh, area of investigation. And we had, as I said, nine stations, eight other stations, both in the northern hemisphere, in Japan, Southern Hemisphere, and so forth. I, of course, picked the best one here, the best comparison. Uh, <clears throat> Henry's uh, was, what was it, Fort? Um, uh, Port Stanley. That was a hard one. <laughs> I'm not showing that one. <laughs> As I mentioned, the next step in the process of the time GCM, instead of going to 30 kilometers, we went down to the ground. And for that, we took the NCAR Community Climate Model, CCM3, which went from zero to 40 kilometers, used the flux coupler through that lower boundary and passed information into the time GCM that went from 40 to 500 kilometers. 
Now, there are two dissimilar models. One is a five degree latitude and longitude with a five minute time step. This is a T42 resolution CCM spectral model with a 20 minute time step. So you had to match this kind of carefully uh, in order to get this. But we did it as a try to see whether it's possible to uh, develop a model that goes all the way down to the ground. And here's just one solution through the mesosphere that goes from the ground all the way up to about 80 kilometers. You can see the tropospheric, and this is the zonal wind at this altitude of, or latitude, about 45, 42 degrees latitude. You can see the tropospheric winds, very noisy and so forth, but you see these disturbances. Uh, here's some very nice waves that are propagating up through the atmosphere. So indeed, this, cut, this type of coupling is quite important for generating waves and getting conditions in the mesosphere um, to match observations. And it's well known that the mesosphere has an awful lot of, of uh, waves in, in the mesosphere. And it affects things like the neutral temperature. You can see these waves rolling along the lower thermosphere, about 100 to about 150 kilometers, a very dynamic active region, before the molecular diffusions kind of smooths things out in the upper thermosphere. And you can see all this variability on the lower part, and it affects things like atomic oxygen. You can see all this structure of atomic oxygen that uh, kind of comes and goes with the waves and is influenced and then eddy diffusion, recombination, uh, mixing and other things. Uh, and also the nitric oxide in the lower thermosphere also has this kind of structure. So it showed that it's important if you're gonna do the thermosphere mesosphere that you should have a model that goes all the way through the ground. Now Hanley found, Hanley Liu found uh, <clears throat> that the model coupled model that we ran for four years, in year number four, gener spontaneously generated a strat one, and a very big one on, on top of that. Very strong planetary wave forcing gave rise to that. And here we see the, in the northern polar region that the stratosphere is warm. This is perturbation temperatures from prior, prior conditions. The mesosphere cool, and then way up high in the thermosphere, we also had a positive response here. Uh, much smaller than these, and it's also in a difficult region to prove because that's right smack in the rural region. And so, and there's all sorts of variability going on and temperatures are fluctuating. But it does, the model shows that it does connect all the way up through the atmosphere and it reverses the winds in various levels. Uh, you get a wind reversal down uh, in the stratosphere and, and uh, another wind reversal up here. So. It shows that the whole atmosphere is coupled and one needs to the whole atmosphere. And that led to Wacom. Uh, this is a very early Wacom slide uh, from HAO. It was Ben Foster and I at the beginning, and then Hanley Liu is now kind of in charge of all this uh, uh, upward extension. Uh, from ECD, we had Rolando Garcia and Dave Kennison. Now Dan Marsh is very active in, in running the whole the Wacom model uh, for the dynamics. We have uh, Fabrizio Sassi and Byron Beauville. And of course, we don't have Byron with us anymore. He, he died a couple of years ago. But uh, uh, we coupled these whole model to make one model, one consistent model that's tied to the NCAR community climate model that's developing the lower atmosphere and then taking all those processes and extending it on upward into the upper atmosphere. And here's a result from Hanley, just showing a, a Wacom result, uh, tropospheric jets, uh, uh, the winter and summer jets over here, the reversals in the mesosphere, and in the thermosphere we have uh, the zonal winds going from basically from pole to pole with maybe some auroral uh, results here. And the mean meridian, meridional circulation is, is from the uh, this is a December solstice from the summer to winter, the winter to summer, and summer to winter up there. And the temperature structure is shown here. So this shows that it is possible to do it, and this is a freely running model. It's not like a time GCM. Uh, oh, let me just uh, show this one particular movie. Now, what I'm showing here is the zonal wind at uh, a latitude, high latitude, isn't it? 100. 
50 degrees latitude, and uh, it's gone from 15 to nearly 500 kilometers, so the whole atmosphere. And the region that I want to point out is this, this particular region in the lower thermosphere. We'll see the upper thermosphere have its normal diurnal circulation, variability in the lower part, but the, the, there's an awful lot of variability in the MLT region. And so we just play that movie and you can see these waves going back and forth, a daily variation, uh, but all this structure in the lower thermosphere that, that is uh, going. Now, <clears throat> To show how complicated this is, I have a, my favorite slide is a, a, a collection of uh, rocket um, uh, profiles for this particular re region that was assembled by Miguel Larson. And that shows <laughs> the, <laughs> the collection of winds for that region. And then you'd kind of look at that and say, you know, what is a modeler to do? Uh, <laughs> There's just about every combination, every kind of response uh, to it. And that's all in this very, very, very active region between 80 and 140 kilometers. So, although well, the Wacom study, there are two versions of Wacom, ground 240, and I believe this one is available on the web. You can download it and run it. Uh, there's Hanley's ground to 500 kilometer extension. Wacom shows that there's considerable variability in the lower thermosphere, and it affects the ionosphere and the upper atmosphere. But Wacom is a freely running model, whereas the Time GCM is a campaign model used for examining, using forcing from data to examine a specific period. So the two models are, are, are different. You can do easier experiments and isolate physical processes in the upper atmosphere much easier than here. And the Wacom only is slowly taking all the physics, dynamics, the dynamo ionosphere out of Wacom and then putting it into, out of the time GCM and putting it into Wacom. So making progress in, in taking this, but still it, there's a ways to go in order to get all of the physics and dynamo regions into Wacom. Now to the future, <clears throat> back in, um, in 1989, uh, Bob Dickinson and I decided to see whether all this hype about CO2 in the lower atmosphere affecting things like climate applied to the upper atmosphere. And you saw that my 1D model that I had in one of the first slides with all the spaghetti lines, uh, that was a one-dimensional global mean model that was, uh, had all the Aronomy. But Bob Dickinson, just after doing Venus, had a very detailed radiative transfer model that handled variable CO2, because Venus has a lot of CO2. So we coupled the two models and did a simulation for various conditions. And the, the slide when the carbon dioxide is doubled from 360 to 720 parts per million is shown here. And so the whole atmosphere will tend to cool. If one goes the other way and goes to the ice age where the uh, CO2 and methane concentration was lower, CO2 about 180 parts per million, you get this dash curve. So there was a big swing in the amount of, uh, depending upon the amount of carbon dioxide that we used at this time. And that also affected the number density of the major species. So the whole atmosphere cooled and it began to sink. And uh, we get on the order of maybe 50% of O, N2, and O2 responding during the global change case and a similar kind of uh, response due to the ice age. Well, that was made in 1989. And there's been a, a big update in, the, in many of the aeronautical processes. At that particular time, we had nitric oxide data that was based on the SME results, and we had uh, solar EUV from the atmospheric explorer. And these have been modified somewhat. We still know that the thermosphere is cooled primarily by molecular conduction and then eddy conduction, but the radiative processes are from the 15 micron band of CO2, 5.3 of NO, and the 63 micron band of, of O triplet P. And as I mentioned, they were tuned primarily for SME and AE era. 
But since then, these other satellites, HALO, SNOWY, ISAAC, and so forth, indicated that the nitric oxide densities are really about a factor five more than uh, the SME process. And this was due primarily between, because of the soft X-rays. Uh, the soft X-ray were measuring some factor of two or so lower uh, than uh, current day measurements are. And then there were some changes in the agronomy. There were some very important temperature dependent coefficients. For example, uh, the N quartet S plus O2 is temperature sensitive and very important. And that gives you, and then this particular uh, reaction. And there's still some uncertainty about branching ratios and other things. Now, the excitation rate that is used is based primarily on experimental data from, from the Russians and others, uh, and it's about 1.5 times 10 to minus 12. And the Bob Dickinson and Ray Robo paper back there used something much smaller on the order of maybe 5 times 10 to minus 13. And the nitric oxide excitation, 4.2 times 10 to 11, is somewhat by a factor of two larger than what was used previously, too. And when you put in these changes, you find that there is a difference. Uh, for one thing, uh, the lower thermosphere, um, when you plot it in terms of altitude, the upper, first in the upper thermosphere, it's a lot less. It was more on the order of 50 to 60 degree uh, temperature drop, and now it's more of 30 degrees. And the same thing for the uh, uh, ice age condition. But in the lower thermosphere, it's gotten warmer. And that's because <laughs> the atmosphere in this particular region has a positive temperature gradient. And so when it cools, it tends to drop in altitude. So the constant pressure surface drops in altitude, but there's a positive temperature gradient. And so it appears uh, as though at a constant altitude that the temperature is getting warmer. But in actuality, this is really, if you'd plotted it in, in pressure coordinates here, the whole atmosphere would tend to show that it's cooling. But since CEDAR measures primarily an altitude, we get this different kind of response. And the same thing for the uh, nitric oxide. So the NO cooling is, is quite important uh, in, in this region. Now this shows the calculated nitric oxide percent difference on the new calculations. We see that CO2 is you know, 100% larger when it goes to 720, a little smaller in the thermosphere because of photodissociation. Uh, the ice age, well, going from 360 to 180 is 50%. But the nitric oxide is changing quite a bit. In the thermosphere, the nitric oxide is dropping by about 30, 40, 50%. In the lower thermosphere, it's, it's, it's increased. And the opposite is true for the ice age conditions. And when you look at the, the cooling processes, uh, this is nitric oxide. Uh, these are differences between present day and global change. So the radiation from nitric oxide cools or, or decreases. It's not as effective in the present, in, in the global change case as it is in the present day. But the CO2 is doubled and it became much larger. But the CO2 is around 110, 105 kilometers, and you, you kind of get a very strong additional radiative cooling. But it doesn't extend all the way up. You, in the, in the um, middle thermosphere, uh, the nitric oxide is not uh, radiating as much. So there's a modulation effect. It's trying to keep, as CO2 wants to get colder, NO says, no, no, uh, you should, I'm going to get colder, I'm going to get warmer, and uh, counterbalance it. So we didn't get the big effect that we predicted for solar medium conditions. And the total radiative cooling primarily is shown here. The fine structure cooling from uh, uh, 63 micron cooling from atomic oxygen is relatively small, only on the order of 5, 10 degrees Kelvin. But we get an increase in the cooling in the lower thermosphere but a decrease in the upper thermosphere. And that has effects of things like the atomic hydrogen. Atomic hydrogen is important for topside ionosphere and also exospheric escape. And also the number density has influences in the magnetosphere in terms of uh, charge exchange and other processes. And that'll increase during the global change 
primarily due to the photo dissociation of, of methane, and it'll increase by 80% here. And during the last ice age, it was a lot less. The electron density, Henry Rishbeth and I looked at it uh, shortly after Bob Dickinson's. We found that the uh, E region uh, electron density will increase, but the F region densities will decrease, and just the opposite for the ice age. And this has been followed on by Stan Solomon and Li Ying Chan, uh, uh, and, and it's uh, holding up. But during solar minimum, this looks very much like the Robel and Dickinson predictions. The, the influence of nitric oxide decreases during solar minimum, and now we get uh, predictions that are 50, degree, or 50 degrees, uh, much different. A little bit more, the Rubble and Dickinson never really crossed over the zero line, but uh, here it shows a little additional cool. And about the same density changes. So it, it says that if you're making measurements, you'll find that you, you get a much greater global change signal from increasing carbon dioxide and methane uh, during solar minimum than you would during solar medium and solar maximum. And I think in the trends symposium that existed, uh, <coughs> that took place last, uh, uh, last week, uh, the, the data tend to support that. And finally, the increased CO2 levels will cool and the whole atmosphere will sink. Maybe 30 kilometers at F region altitudes going down to three kilometers in the mesopause. The effects of NO cooling and chemical heating modulate the thermospheric response to global change. And the largest change is said to predict during solar minimum. And as I mentioned, it's consistent with the data. So these are, uh, <coughs> and the whole global changed atmosphere is, is very ripe for all kinds of uh, studies. Uh, how are the winds going to change? Will the aurora respond differently when there's more radiative cooling and interactions? Gravity wave propagation, tidal wave propagation, all these will have, are very interesting uh, topics for future research. Now finally, I would just like to close um, <clears throat> It's something Paul Hayes and I did a long time ago, and I haven't really seen very much in the literature beyond what we did in 1979. And uh, that's the global electric circuit. Uh, <clears throat> Paul and I modeled the Earth's global electric circuit, and it's shown in this schematic. We get thunderstorms with positive and negative charge sending currents to the ionosphere. They go over to the cross magnetic field line into the other hemisphere. There's a 300,000 volt potential difference between the ground and the ionosphere. And there's a 100 volt difference between my toe and my head here. It's only a pico, pico ampere current flowing in it. But, uh, but there are, and it's all maintained by the global thunderstorm activity. Now during global change, many of the models, the lower atmosphere models are saying there's going to be more thunderstorms. The thunderstorms are going to be bigger and they're going to be move, slowly moving. And so there'll be totally different kinds of uh, electrical effects. Uh, <clears throat> one of the electrical effects is shown here in this, using these perspective illustrations. We put in a thunderstorm. This is around 100 kilometers. This is uh, 75 or 50. This is 25, 8 kilometers, 4 kilometers, 2 kilometers. And you can see we, we put in a source over here goes to the ionosphere, flows over to the other side. If you put the source of thunderstorms near the equator, it doesn't have this uh, cross-field transfer of electricity, but it kind of bulges up the equatorial region. And down below the thunderstorm, you get these strong negative regions. And the, it, it depends very much on the uh, Earth's electrical conductivity, which is going to change like during solar proton events, cosmic ray variations, Aerosols are going to attach, and the ions are going to become heavy. So it's a, it's a region of research that I think needs to be re-examined in the, the fact that uh, things are changing uh, globally. And here I just show the calculated electric field at the ground, about 100 volts per meter at the ground, and the cosmic ray influence showing you know, greater conductivity at higher latitudes and shielding would be 
And these are thunderstorm regions that we just parameterized and sent the current up to it. And we find that the, the main currents are flowing primarily in the peaks. Here's the Himalayas here right along the Rocky Mountains and the Andes, and then these are regions of thunderstorms. So um, finally, I just wanted to mention that there's also, and, and this would be a very nice model to incorporate in Wacom in order to couple to the dynamo and also if there are any other processes that go out into the magnetosphere. So in conclusion, it's been a wonderful career. We've had a lot of fun. Everyone has participated in, in this modeling effort somehow. I would always ask somebody, what was that parameterization you just told me about? Uh, what's this? And then I'd grab it and put it in the model and, and um, slowly it built up to be of the complexity it is at present day. Thank you.